It's September 22nd, 1735, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ollie, the Retrospectors. The first law of dealing with the monarchy is when the king gives you a gift, act grateful. So it was that First Lord of the Treasury Robert Walpole moved in today in history in 1735 to a little terraced house on a swampy street by the park that he didn't terribly like, so spent three years renovating, but was gifted to him by George II. The address, 10 Downing Street, or as it was known then, 5 Downing Street. Yeah, and he moved in, but he did actually refuse it as the personal gift that it was intended. Instead, he asked the king to make it available as the official residence, not just to him, but all future first lords of the treasury. We should note, by the way, that that position uh, is sort of the, effectively the prime ministerial position. In that. I reckon people have guessed that twist <laughs> from context. <laughs> That's probably true. Um, but, but also what's amusing about it is that it was given to him as official thanks for stabilising Britain's finances, also stabilising its foreign affairs and also kind of getting the monarchy back to a state of, uh, of, of being under control as well. And you're like... Okay, here's a house. A house. That's what you're giving. Okay, a house. <laughs> Box Fine. of muffins, not enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Walpole's often called Britain's first prime minister, but as you hinted at, the position didn't actually exist and it never really came to exist either. The reason that he ended up there was that he basically just ate up all of the top positions. So he was the first Lord of the Treasury, yes. He was also Chancellor of the Exchequer and the leader of the House of Commons. This state of affairs was dubbed the Robinocracy. So he had just basically created it by accepting all of the top positions in the country simultaneously. I mean, on one hand, you could argue that he was modest for not wanting to be given the property, you know, as a personal grace and favour home and wanting it as an official residence, but also the fact that he probably just didn't want to be lumbered with it. You know, it was three years between him being given it and him actually moving in. There had to be these extensive renovations just to make it livable. And even then, it was hardly, the, you know, the most gracious residence in town. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I, I wasn't being entirely obnoxious when I said that he didn't like it much. He didn't like it much. I mean, it seems weird. You know, why wouldn't you want to live in the centre of London? But back then, it kind of wasn't considered the cool part of the centre of London. And why would you want to live your job? Just because that's where the Palace of Westminster is. Like, ideally, you'd be a mile away from that, wouldn't you? Not being bothered constantly. But Walpole had a very good understanding of public relations which is part of the reason why he lasted 21 years into the job, whether he called it Prime Minister or not. Uh, Lady Mary Wortley Montagu records him as saying that, quote, whoever neglected the world would be neglected by it. In other words, live in the public eye. Show the people that you are there representing them. And so it, there was a need to have a official residence so that the people knew where you were. And from that point of view, even though he thought it was a bit pokey and smelly and dank... <laughs> <laughs> um, it looked like a person's house. Like it was good yeah. for the people, not just the nobility, to know that the lead minister of the country lived somewhere a bit like where they lived. Yeah, the day after he moved in, the London Daily Post informed its readers, yesterday the Right Honourable Sir Robert Walpole with his lady and family removed from their house in St James's Square to his new house adjoining to the Treasury in St James's Park. And so this was part of the issue as well is that Sir Robert Walpole was a very well-off man and he had a lovely house in St James's Square. Downing Street at the time, you know, obviously now it's been almost entirely taken over by government buildings, but in this time was actually home to, you know, street walkers, gin mills. It wasn't considered, uh, it wasn't just, oh, it wasn't, you know, a cool part of town. It wasn't the kind of place where someone of Walpole's status would even want to be seen. I mean, this actually would become useful later. You know, Sir William Gladstone, famously, one of his hobbies was going out from Downing Street Street and trying to talk sex workers into pursuing a more virtuous course of living. And apparently like, there is no evidence that he did anything else with them. He genuinely... Yeah, sure. He did, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and you know, at the time, it was pretty convenient because Number 10 was right on the doorstep of that kind of area. Yes, but at the same time, it was not a move that immediately stuck. It was another 20 years after Walpole left Downing Street in 1742 that the next First Lord of the Treasury moved in. And the next person who... 
uh, chose to live there was Lord North, who became Prime Minister in 1770. And he held a very memorable dinner party the night that he moved in, when basically civil unrest broke out. And there was a huge riot because angry Protestants were unhappy with his policy towards Catholics. And they rioted all over London uh, in what became known as the Gordon Riots. But actually, his dinner guests, rather than being terribly frightened about the situation, actually climbed to the top of the house and just watched the fires burning across London like, ooh, a light bit of entertainment to end the evening. How lovely. (laughs) (laughs) So why was 10 Downing Street such a poorly constructed house? Why did nobody want to live there? So Downing hired Christopher Wren to be the architect for the street. Never heard of him. Yeah, exactly. Sounds pretty glamorous. But at the time, in 1654, he was a scientist and astronomer. He was considered one of Oxford's most promising young dons, and he was years away from becoming involved in architecture. So, you know, he did do it, but it took a really long time to build the streets. There was lots of complicated... This was sort of around the time of the Restoration, and the land had been sold under Cromwell, but then the royal family then revoked all of that. So it took a long time to build. Downing died just after it was completed. Uh, He died in 1684. But even with Christopher Wren at the helm, they couldn't really get around the fact that Downing Street was built on soft ground Mm. and so all the houses on it were prone to subsidence and so they were being repaired all of the time but this went on for like hundreds of years for hundreds of years there would periodically be calls in the press for the whole place to be torn down and rebuilt saying you know this is costing so much money to rebuild we could have built a grand new purpose-built house for the Prime Minister but you know it's never happened Yeah I mean really it's a portal to a hundred rooms in several larger houses that are connected by a warren of hallways and staircases and offices. Um, and yeah, you, you you know, you can say, well, let's refurbish the house, but that's mm. really just the facade. That's really just the entrance. It's a long established building with hundreds of people working in it. The other thing that was interesting as well about Wren's original design and the house as it would have been known to George Downing is that the bricks mm. were yellow. And the only reason that they're black, and we know them as black, is because of London's pollution, which just makes me feel queasy. Like, black (laughs) from smog and smart. Um, And then what happened is, yeah, when they refurbished it, I think under Harold Wilson, they realised that under the the smart is, is yellow brick. But people were so used to Downing Street looking black by that point that they painted the new bricks black. As Britain has fallen behind in its smog levels, they now have to paint it artificially (laughs) black. It's like trying to imagine how the Statue of Liberty would have looked when it was at its most sort of gleaming, glistening, uh, you know, day one self. Uh, So Winston Churchill uh, said that number 10 was shakily and lightly built by the profiteering contractor whose name they bear. (laughs) So that's, you know, that's sort of his assessment of the place that he was forced to live in when he was PM as well. Well, there's lots of illustrious names from history that have hated Mm. Downing Street. Pitt the Younger called it vast and awkward. Disraeli called it dingy and decaying. Um, And, you know, even in modern times, between Blair and Sunak, they've all lived in number 11, um, because it's more spacious, actually, than number 10. It also makes some sense, perhaps, all of this prime ministerial hate towards the place that they were forced to live... That, you know, Boris Johnson engaged in what became the most incredibly controversial effort to put some new (laughs) wallpaper up. And, you know, it was regarded as this terrible scandal, not least because the wallpaper was so immensely expensive at at a time of ongoing austerity and sort of nationwide poverty and difficulty, but also... You know, on the flip side, maybe the place needed a bit of a spruce up still. <laughs> well, and in terms of furnishing and decoration, historically, prime ministers have been responsible for footing the bill for all of that themselves. And for a long time, that wasn't an issue. You know, most prime ministers came from either the gentry or at least, you know, the well to do mercantile class who had their own London homes and could easily afford renovations. It would become a problem for Ramsay MacDonald, who entered number 10 as a first Labour prime minister in 1924. He didn't really, he hadn't really given a lot of thought to the fact that he was expected to furnish n- number 10 himself, he came in and realised that there was basically nothing there. They didn't have things like cutlery and bedding. And in addition to this, prime ministers were expected to pay for servants and for mm. the hosting of guests. So he sent his 20-year-old daughter Ishbel down to the January sales on Oxford Street, where she <laughs> literally went around the shops buying up as many homeware bargains as she could because there was just nothing in the house. It's like when you turn up at an Airbnb and realise there's no towels. Um, the two reception rooms for receiving important guests, the White Room and the Blue Room, were remodelled by Thatcher, the latter becoming the Terracotta Room, and that is what it is still called, the Terracotta Room, because she 
preferred a relaxing orange hue. She would have liked the bricks on the outside of the building before they got <laughs> <laughs> stained with London muck. <laughs> And so another week of retrospecting ends. But next week begins a day early at Club Retrospectors. Join us now to get an exclusive episode every Sunday. Patreon.com slash retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.